I'm going to die, but I'm going to raise from the dead. There were no parables. There were no stories. There were no stories with heavenly meanings. Jesus told it blatantly as much as you told your children. If you touch that, I'm going to slap your hand. You know, there was no, it was clear. There was nothing left to the imagination. It was not ambiguous. It was a matter of this is going to happen, but I, this is what also got to happen. But the Bible informs us out of those times as we read those passages where it is cut and dry that the disciples didn't understand it. But Christianity, our faith in Jesus Christ, is not based on the, re on the crucifixion, but is based on the resurrection. Now there is so much more that came with it, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. Because there is so much that happened in the time span of Jesus being Betrayed, being put on trial, all the way to the fact of the um, resurrection. There is so much that's sandwiched in there that's meant for us as the believer. And it is all based upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection is what the, put the stamp of validation upon all the other events. So why must Jesus Christ die in the first place? If someone would please read Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31. Genesis 1, Genesis 1 and verse 31. And there's something particular we're going to pull out right out of this passage. So here we have God. He's looking back on his creation. And how does he define it? Good. Not, not just good, but it's very, very good. Now, if we go back after day one, day two, day three, God looks back on his handiwork for that day. And I'm not going to nitpick, but how does he declare his work for that day? It was good. It was very good. But regardless, when we look back at it, if we put it even in the big terms, it was perfect. What God created was perfect. He looked back and he said, you know what? That pleased me. It's good. I can't add anything more to it. I, I definitely don't want to do anything less to it. It's the best that it could possibly be right now. He gets to day two, and it was good. It is perfect. It's the best that it could very be. We get to the end of creation, and God looks back, and he contemplates everything that he did, and it was very good. It's perfect. There's nothing that anybody or anything else that could add to it that wouldn't add any finishing touches or detail. It's exactly the way it needs to be. And then in Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27, we see that God does something. What is different from all of God's other creations? He made man in his own image. So God looks back and he makes man. And then he also makes someone else. He makes a woman out of the rib of man. And God called the man Adam. And God called the woman. Oh, I threw a wrench in there. Actually, God never calls her Eve. Adam's the one that gives her the name Eve. God made man and woman. Sorry, I just wanted to make wheels because now when we start reading the Bible, somebody says, well, God made um, Eve, called her Eve. No, God didn't call her Eve. All that was was a defense mechanism for the future. But regardless, God created Adam and God created Eve. God named Adam, Adam named Eve. Because she was the mother of all living things. And the verses are right there in your notes. You can reference back. And at this point, how do we declare, say that God would declare his creation? It's very good. So every time God looks back at creation, he sees that it's very good. So then God does something special for this man and this woman. What does he create that's special for? He creates the Garden of Eden for them, almost their own little paradise for them to keep. Basically, it was their home. 
if we would put it in modern terms, it was their house. That's where they lived, that's where they slept, that's where they ate, that's what they took care of. You know, what you do on your day off from work, you go home and you take care of it, you clean up, you do this. There's always something to do around the house. But the Garden of Eden was Adam and Eve's home. And when God looked down at creation at this time, how did he view it? He had the garden, he had Adam, he had Eve. Everything was working smoothly, and he saw everything, and he would declare it as very good. It was perfect. It was, everything was going smoothly. He'd come down in the pool of the day. He talked with Adam and Eve. In fact, the Bible says that he walked in the present, in the garden. There's only one voice that walks that I know, and that's Jesus Christ. But that is a personal opinion. But we do know that God came down and walked with them, and he talked with them, and he communed with them in the pool of the evening. But something happens. Now the monkey wrench gets tossed in there. Yeah, the snake comes along. The snake comes along. Yeah. And what do we know about the serpent the snake? Satan. It was Satan, but when we look at the snake, it was the snake was beautiful. And it's not like a, a snake like we would know today. The snake had legs. And it talked with you. And they started talking to Eve and said, well, did Adam say, did God say this? And did God say that? What did God tell you? And we don't really know if Eve got her information concerning the tree of knowledge of tree of good and evil from Adam or if she got it directly from God. Because when we look at scripture, there's a little bit of wording difference between what Adam, uh, Eve tells um, the serpent. Because nowhere in the scripture, and I'm just going off of knowledge at this point, I'm far from the notes, we'll get back there. But God never said you couldn't touch it. He just said, don't eat of it. Eve throws in that word touch. So whether or not Adam said, you know what, Eve, don't even touch it. Stay away from it. And things got misconstrued. I don't know. But we do know that something happens. And Eve partakes of the fruit of the tree. And what does she do? She runs to Adam. Adam, you got to try this. Now, what does the Bible inform us about Eve when it comes to her partaking of the fruit? Sister Jan, I'm sorry, I'm so far off your notes at this point. We are, we are in the Bible. We're just far off those notes. But what does the Bible inform us about Eve and taking of the fruit? Do you remember? <coughs> There's a big old D word the Bible says. D. Huh? Behold. Not behold. I know I drew that in songs, but not behold. But she was deceived. Adam, was he deceived? He was deceived by the woman. He wasn't deceived. The Bible says that he knew exactly the woman was deceived, but Adam was not. Now, did he disobey God? Yes. Adam willfully disobeyed God. See, the woman did not really know, I shouldn't say didn't know what she was doing, his, but regardless, he was deceived. She was manipulated. But when Adam took the fruit, he knew exactly what he was doing. He was aware of what God said. He was aware of what was going on. And it was almost, you know what? I'll just take a bite. I'm going to do it anyhow. And because of that act of disobedience, sin didn't fall upon womankind because of it. But Adam, as the head of the household, sin came through Adam. That's why one of the reasons when we talk about the virgin birth, a human man wasn't involved was because sin passed from Adam. Not that we all were born into sin, because we all were. For all were. Uh, yeah. Like I said, I'm so far off my notes, it's not even funny. <laughs> For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It passed upon all of us, but we both had a human male and a human female involved in the recreation process. Mary had the Holy Ghost involved. And with the passing from the head, Adam, she was a deviated, um, Jesus Christ was a deviated from that. Now, Pat, moving on. And let's just read Romans 5.12. Romans 5.12, and that will show that Adam was the one responsible. Romans 5.12. And then we'll move on to the next day, the results.
Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. As a result of Adam, not Eve. Now, at this point, when God, after they partook, Adam partook of the fruit, did God really look down and say that everything was perfect, like or everything was good or very good, like the day of the past? No. Why not? Because sin had entered into the world. And along with sin came death, death disease, sickness, where man must live forever. Now he became a mortal creature. And because of that, something had to be done. And God didn't say, you know what? Man messed up his body but through sin and allowed death to come down. But he lost something a lot more precious. And it wasn't just a matter of what he lost, but it's a matter of what we lost. And when I say we, the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Because there's only one thing that God desired in the first place. And that was to have fellowship with man. And that had been broken. He could no longer come down and dwell with him in the cool of the evening like he once could. Maybe he couldn't speak to him as he once could because his spiritual eyes and his spiritual ears were now deaf. So now God desired and longed to put all this back. And when we get into the crucifixion, we are slowly restoring things that were lost all the way back at creation. One of the very first things that we notice as we're going through the crucifixion, I hate to say the progress, uh, process, but the crucifixion time frame is a better phrase. With Jesus Christ, was one of the first things that they did, that Pilate did to try to get the Jews to release, allow Jesus to be released. Because remember, it's not that he didn't have the power, but he was leaving the decision to them. It was passed over and it was tradition by the Roman government that we will release one prisoner back to you of your choosing. That was their tradition. But the Jews wanted Jesus Christ to be crucified. And on a side note, take notice that it wasn't the sinners outside of the church that crucified Jesus. But it was his own church members. It was the religious people. In fact, on a side note, it was his treasurer that betrayed him in the first place. But with that being said, Pontius Pilate did something to try to have the Jews to re decide to release Jesus instead of Barabbas. So what did Pilate do? I'm trying to pull it out and refresh our memories. Huh? Well, he well, he did that later. But what did he have done to Jesus? Had he had him flogged. And we, he had him scorched. He had him beaten. And when we look at this in the Greek, and the Greek word that John used means to flog, literally to scourge. The words, the Greek word that Matthew Mark used meant uh, like to whip, to lash. We know that it was the cat and nine tails from history to study, pulling apart. It had metal chunks, bone, glass, sharp objects attached to the end. That way it would dig into the flesh and rip it off. But why did Jesus Christ have to go through that? Would someone please read Isaiah 53, 5, Isaiah 53, 5, and someone else find 1 Peter 2 and 24. 1 Peter 2, 24, and Isaiah 53 and verse 5. And read Isaiah first. Isaiah 53, 5. And with his stripes we are healed. What about 2 Peter chapter 2? Yes, 1 Peter. I'm sorry, brother. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. By whose stripes ye were healed. So we have Isaiah using R and we have Peter using second. 
What do we see exactly transpiring in this passage? When we look at these stripes, they are referring to the scourging that Jesus Christ had. Not the crucifixion itself, but the scourging. Why did Jesus Christ endure the scourging? This wasn't necessary for the salvation of sins. For our healing. It was for our healing. What did Adam lose in the garden when he sinned? He brought death, disease. You know, when God comes and gives us something, he gives us so much more than we could ever do or ask for. He gives us um, exceedingly and abundantly above all we could ask or think. But the reason, reason that Christ was scourged wasn't just to make a public mockery of him so hopefully the Jews would have pity on him, but this was coming long time advance, and it was for our healing. As I was reading this passage, and this is just me reminiscing here in the last couple of weeks, I've been going back to the old time uh, miracle evangelist. You know, it seems like we know that God heals, but in the church world, it almost seems like we lost something. Because back in the 1950s, God was really moving once again. Regardless of their lifestyle, how they ended up, whether you agree with it, disagree with it, men like A.A. A. Allen, Jack Coe, Catherine Pullman, these were people that saw miracles almost on a daily basis. And we don't mean just one or two, but God did great and mighty, mighty things. And it all comes back to this right here. What God, what Christ did on the cross. In fact, Brother Eli, you'll get a kick out of this one. I was there is a gentleman by the name of Robert Lairdon. He wrote a book called John God's Generals. In it, he writes about the early, uh, if you want to call it, founders of Pentecost, fathers of Pentecost, and I mean American Pentecost. We're going back to A. A. Allen. We're going back to Smith Wigglesworth. We're going back to uh, the head of the Salvation Army, William Booth. Just a whole different one. And what he does is he dives into their lives, kind of giving a biography of their life. So we know what happened there. And there he told of a man by the name of John G. Lee, who dealt with a plague that broke out in South Africa. He was a missionary there. And this plague just ran rampant, killing people. And it was so dangerous that pastors were not doing funerals. They were avoiding them at all costs because they didn't want any interaction with the dead. But John G. Lake said that the law of sin and death was part of his life now that Christ has set him free from the law of sin and death. He didn't have to worry about that. And he said, I will bury your dead regardless. And he dared them to take saliva from a dead corpse, put it on his hand, and he said, as soon as it touches my hand, that um, bacteria will die. Sure enough, they placed his hand under a microscope, and all the bacteria from that plague died. They couldn't believe it, so they went and did several other testing to prove it accurate. Why did Jesus allow them to scourge him? Why did, they allow, why did he allow them to beat him in such manner? If we get down to it, he wasn't just beaten. But the Bible says he was beaten upon recognition. The Bible describes the scourging so intense that the Bible says his reins are showing, were showing. What were his reins? It means his kidneys. His skin was ripped off. His flesh was ripped off. His meat was ripped off. That his kidneys, his internal organs were exposed. Why did Jesus Christ do it? It wasn't for our sins, because the scorching had nothing to do with our sins. But he said, you know what? I'm going to go a little bit farther. They don't just need spiritual healing. But my people, they need a physical healing as well. And they need something to go full back for. And this is going to be a gift that I give them for a future. Adam might have lost it in the garden. But I'm going to restore it. From there, Jesus went from our physical healing. So now, I need to restore fellowship with man. It may not be as we once walked with him in the garden. It might be a different type of walk. But I'm going to walk with him as closely as possible. And that brought him to the need for our spiritual healing. It took him from that scorching post 
where he was too weak to even carry his own cross member um, down the Della Rosa to Mount Galgotha. But it brings him to that hill where Christ purchased our spiritual healing on Galgotha. The cross was to restore fellowship with man once again. Romans 5 and verse 14. If someone would please read that. Romans 5, 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So sin got passed on to all men. It doesn't matter if you disobeyed God from the get-go. If, if you were trained right and you followed God, and even like Enoch, you walked as closely as possible, that sin was still passed on to your, passed on to you regardless. But Jesus brought salvation into the world. Do you still have that passage, brother, Romans 5? Yeah. You want to jump down to verse 19, please? For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Because of the disobedience of Adam, here we have the idea, I shouldn't say just the idea, but we call this the concept of federal headship. Adam was the head over all humanity. What happened to him got passed down. We saw that in Romans chapter 5 and verse 14. Because Adam sinned, sin passed to all creatures. Well, I say all creatures. I say that loosely. It was passed to all mankind. Don't take it out of context. But <coughs> because of Jesus Christ, we may all live. Jesus being referred to as the second Adam. He had to die as the spotless Lamb of God for the sins of the world. Will someone please read Revelation? Read John 1 29. John 1 29. And then after that, we will read Revelation 13, 8. If someone will get that. Revelation 13, 8. So John 1 and verse 29, if you have it. Next day, John seeth Jesus coming on the man and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. When we're looking at this passage, we're not talking about John the Beloved, but we're talking about John the Baptist. He was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And how does the Bible say that John the Baptist described Jesus Christ? We're going to use that big B word, Sister Linda. Behold! The Lamb of God. What does Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8 say? Uh, state concerning the Lamb of God. Revelation 13, 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship them in the name of God and go away to the from the foundations of the world. He was the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Really, if we wanted to jump back into the Old Testament, we already saw a type and a shadow and a picture of this already coming in the sacrifices of the temple and the tabernacle. But John said to the Jews, Behold the Lamb of God. What was the purpose for the Lamb of God? Revelation 13 tells us he was to be slain. And when was it decided that he was going to die for all of humanity, that we may have fellowship with him once again? From the foundation of the world. Was that before or after God looked over creation and said it was very good? It was before. This reveals to us the omniscience or the all-knowing capacity of God. He knew what was going to happen from the very beginning. He made everything as perfect as possible. But he still knew that sin was going to enter into the world. And he was going to make a way. Not just for our spiritual, our physical healing, as Isaiah wrote about, but God was already prepared to make a way for our spiritual healing. But these two things, the spiritual healing and the physical healing, they're all based on one event. And what is that one event? 
the resurrection. If Jesus Christ would have never rose from the dead, forget our preaching that will be in vain. All those stripes he took upon his back, all those beatings, all those lashings, his kidneys being exposed, the crown of thorns being planted on his head, the mocking, the fact that he didn't have enough strength to carry his own cross to the hill and needed help. The Son of God did not have enough strength to carry one of his own creations. That tree that he created, not even a full tree, he could not bear the weight of the cross to make it there. It all would have been in vain. The fact that he had to push up for each and every breath. It doesn't matter how many people he healed throughout his ministry. If he would have never rose from the dead, it all would have been in vain. All of Christianity, everything that you believe that is in this Bible and everything that I believe that is in, within this Bible, and I do stress within this Bible because man takes the Word of God and construes it and pulls it apart and puts it back together in a whole another mosaic that it's not meant to be. But whatever the Word of God is, it is true, it is powerful. And everything that we believe, us meeting here today, would be in vain if Jesus Christ would have never rose from the dead. It was a necessity. Joshua McDowell wrote an article many, 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 many years ago. And he made this statement. Either Jesus Christ was a liar, either he was a lunatic, or he really was Lord. He was who he said he was. If he came claiming that he could heal the sick, and that he could grant salvation. He was a liar. If he would have never rose from the dead. All those times he said that they will destroy the temple. But three days later it will be made whole again. Every time he told the disciples at the end. I'm going to die but I will rise again. It would have been a lie. But what do we call a person who believes their own lies? A lunatic doesn't mean that they don't believe it. They think that it is true. Any one of us who have lived through the Cold War and paid attention to politics, my mind goes back to Joe McCarthy, the guy who went through the government, based his whole political platform on the Red Scare, sorting out, finding communists, American communists that were spies in the American government. That was his whole political campaign. And in the end, poof, it seems like he believed a lie, and it was just as there. It would bring uh, a little bit closer to date. What do you think of Al Gore going on about the global warming campaign? He might have used it in his presidential run, but he's still pushing for it, pushing for it. Does he truly believe that is the case? Or did he believe his own political lie, and now he's just wrapped up in golf in it? A lunatic will believe their own lie that to the point that to them it's true. They can tell you the walls of this building are bright blue. Now, for those of us that are colorblind, we know that it's like a cream. And they're going to, but they would be the ones that would be here to argue and persuade you. No, it's blue. It's blue. It really is blue. Even though you know without a shadow of doubt that it's not, the lunatic believes his own lie. So if Jesus wasn't a liar, well, maybe he was a lunatic. Maybe he truly thought he was the Son of God. Maybe he truly thought that he could heal people. Maybe he truly thought that he could forgive somebody else's sins. Because what did he say? What's easier, to heal a man or to forgive their sins? Well, we see the physical ramifications of a healing. Man, a person that gets up and takes off his own bed, he, he was obviously healed. Either it was staged or it was healed. It was a true miracle. But we don't see for people's sins to be forgiven. We can't physically see that. But if Jesus really believed that, he could have been a lunatic. What separates Jesus Christ from being a lunatic or a Lord? The resurrection. If he would have never rose from the dead, everything we do is in vain. We have a lot of people that are looking for gods that are buried in today's society. What's the famous saying out there? 
Well, there's many paths to heaven. You know, I can get there through my own good deeds, or I don't think that a loving God would send somebody to hell. Or, uh, if I do this, God will, God will see it. Or my favorite, I'll make sure I'm there on church on Sunday. I might not be living right, but God will take notice that I've been in church on Sunday. Like God's up in heaven with his other many books. Right next to the book of life, I'm sure, is the book for Sunday school attendance and church attendance. <laughs> yep, they were present today. They get a gold star. But what does John chapter 14, verse 6 state? John 14, 6. Before we read John 14, 6, let me read Luke chapter 24. Luke 24, I'm going to read from verses 1 through 6 real quick. Now, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, there came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. We know that from other gospel accounts, this was the women. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, and several other with them. They came to embalm the body of Jesus Christ with the spices. Bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed, there about the whole, two men stood by them in shining garments. Who are these two men? Angels. Angels are in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of God must be delivered into the hands of the sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. So I read that one more verse. What does John chapter 14, verse 6 state? John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And how do people get to heaven? Only through Jesus. Only through Jesus. By Muhammad? Nope. By Gandhi? Nope. Where are they at? They're dead. They're dead. Do the people get there by their own good works? Nope. No. Why don't we get there by our own good works? Because we can't. Only through Jesus. You can't. Only through Jesus. What does Scripture say about um, our righteousness? Filthy will see right. There are both correct. And when we get down to what is it speaking of by our righteousness, it's referring to our works. Our works, our good deeds. Well, if I do this, God will remember. If I go to church, God will remember. I might go out and sin during the week, but God will remember this good deed that I did to try to get there. Or, you know, somebody's not living right and they know, well, God knows my heart. You're sure right He knows your heart. I mean, God... We don't know our own heart is deceitfully wicked, but and we're trying to constantly introspect, but I'm telling you what, there's only one way to heaven. And it's through Jesus Christ. Not just his death on the cross, because the death on the cross was for our sins. It wasn't by the scourging, because the scourging was to give back something that was lost, just like the day of Pentecost. The reason we speak in tongues is to regain back what was lost at, at battle. God confused the language to divide the people. Now he brings in their, and unifies people through the time. But Jesus is the only way to heaven. Not any other way. Because if we would try to do it on our own, we know the Bible says, because if we would try to do it by good deeds, we would boast of it. And then we would be prideful. And God hates the proud. He despises the proud. a little bit healthy because I'm losing the verse I yeah. had earlier. I remember it throughout the week. Probably go before that. Oh, there's a verse that says, oh, he despises the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Kind of a thing. That's what I thought. Yeah, pretty much. But even if we try to do it through our own works, you know, there's nothing there alive. In. What makes us alive is the Holy Ghost. And that's, how, and the Bible describes that as our earnest, which the earnest is a little bit of our inheritance that we're going to receive in heaven. So God gives us a little taste, but it's the Holy Ghost that makes our spirit alive, that quickens us and makes us a living spirit. Not our own works, 
not some other prophet. And it's all because there's only one way to heaven, it's through Jesus Christ. And he wasn't a liar, and he wasn't a lunatic, but he was Lord. He resurrected from the grave, and because he resurrected from the grave, all the works that he did up to the cross, from the time that he was captured, and I mean the works by receiving the stripes for our healing, and the death of the cross, which was his sacrifice for our sins. It wasn't in vain. But it was verified and placed a big stamp of approval on because of the resurrection. And we can see that the Father accepted the blood of Christ because when Mary saw him in the garden, she said, no. he said, don't touch me because I'm not yet ascended to the Father. The sin sacrifice, the blood, when that high priest was carrying that bull, nobody could touch him. Otherwise, the whole sacrifice would be defiled. But when he came back, what did he say to Thomas? Touch my hands, touch my son. Let me show you this is me. And it's all because he resurrected from the grave. He resurrected from the dead. By power through the Holy Ghost. With that being said, let us bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we give you all praise and glory that your God who reigns on high and others are not like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke any attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property, above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move, having his way. Anoint the song leader and the musicians, Lord. Give them a special blessing as they these in the songs you have us to sing. As they praise you upon the string instruments of the Lord, 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 anoint the pastor from my hand, lift as he brings forth your word today, Lord. And Lord, just anoint our hearts and our minds to receive the message which you have for us, but even greater than that, Lord, may we apply it to our hearts, Lord, that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that it would not fall by the wayside, but that we would be transformed to your very image, Lord, because that's what it's all about, Lord, is you working with us, that we may be conformed to your will, conform to the image of Jesus Christ. He is the standard by which we will all be judged one day, Lord. And may we not stand before you in embarrassment or shame, Lord. And may we be doing our best to conform to your will that you may transform us into the image that you desire us to be. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.